South Africa is a member of the World Bank and the IMF, and a lot of concern about South Africa dipping into those funds that they, they are contributing to um, is because the IMF and the World Bank has a, have a long history um, of quote-unquote bad policies, if you want to call them that. So since the 1980s, um, those institutions have really given a lot of financing and aid to a lot of African countries in particular and a lot of developing countries. And in a lot of African countries, these have not yielded kind of structural reforms or structural transformation that they were anticipating to bring about. And so from the 80s, there's been a huge um, presence of IFIs and international financial institutions um, in, in the African continent. And what that has done is that it led to what people call the last decade, um, because these countries were in such crises and still are, right? So we see that there's huge inequalities in these countries, that they do not have industries, um, that they're still not as economically developed as what that aid and finance was supposed to do. And so people worry a lot about policy externalization, which means that the international finance institutions are telling you what your policy should be. Um, and so because the IMF and World Bank assistance, which is actually different, these two institutions do different things, people are afraid that they will then dictate to South Africa what our policy should be. And we worry that those policies will, will result, result in bad outcomes economically for the people. So I think in terms of the IMF and the World Bank have said that they will not um, attach conditionalities, but um, the IMF has a rapid financing um, kind of institution or credit institution that South Africa could actually qualify for. But also in the in their concept of what they say is that you don't need an economic program to get that funding. But at the same time, we can't exclude the fact that the IMF, right, their, their mandate is balance of payments. So they, they, their interest is about demand side economics. They, they've got a particular particular mandate that they still have to reach. And so we have to understand and we are cautious of the fact that, yes, it might seem that there are no conditions, but at the same time, you have to understand that this is also about political power and political influence um, in ways that we can't predict. And so in South Africa, considering these, um, these, these um, loaning facilities, it's actually up to our government to actually ensure that there really are no detrimental conditions um, that are anti-poor, particularly. Um, and so that is, that is really where it is. And it's to say that conditions exist, but the question is, what are those conditions? And this is not to say the government should go and get those loans, but it's to say that even when the IMF and the World Bank say there will be no conditions, we still have to be cautious and walk into this contract, this contract, contractual engagement, right, to ensure that it's, it's yielding what we want. You don't go to the bank um, and say you want a car, and then they say to you, well, if you don't pay this loan, we're going to take your whole family away in your house. And you say, okay, sure. You know, you actually want to know more. You want to know what those actual conditions are before you sign on to that um, deal. Oh, that's a difficult one. <laughs> Um, so the, the, the debate has really revolved around whether South Africa should take the money or not. Um, and I think I would argue that South Africa has a number of um, domestic resources that we can first of all tap into, um, and that should we, and, and I'm not saying we should prioritize going to the IMF first, I'm saying we should look internally, domestic resource mobilization is possible. We've got a GP, GPF, we've got UIF, we've got many resources that many countries actually don't have, and we are unique unique case in that way because we've got the surplus of pension money, right? And that's not to say that's where we should go first either, but to say that we can explore those avenues, we can explore non-conventional economic tools that we haven't done in the past. Even what Saab is doing now is unprecedented in our country. They're doing more than what we usually see from them. So to say that there are many ways we can explore it. And Right now, we have to consider that in the market, this might be actually the cheapest loan interest that we can get, right? So in terms of those loans, they might be the cheapest. And in the long run, if we borrow from somewhere else, we might actually find ourselves in significantly more debt than if we're taking this loan. But of course, the cost is not really the amount of money. It's really the cost 
is the conditionalities and that's what people are concerned about. Um, and so we, we need to weigh those costs. How much will it cost in monetary terms, but also what does it cost to human lives? What does it cost to livelihoods in this country? What does it cost to sovereignty? What does it cost to, you know, all these other factors um, that cannot have a monetary value? So South Africa is a, a shareholder in many development banks, well, in the BRICS Development Bank in particular. And I think, again, it's always the same issue around conditionalities, right? The BRICS Bank will also, it's not just about the money, and that's not how banks operate. Like, I think almost people have to reflect from a space of when I go to the bank, what is required of me? Um, and what are the conditions if I do not pay or default that money? Um, and so it's the same thing applies, right? Like, this is a, an avenue from where we can access funds, right? One billion is a lot of money. But at the same time, we should still be cautious of these deals. Um, it's not getting money for the sake of getting money. Um, um, it can't be, um, and we always have to consider that. And I think in the past I've advocated for a human, a human rights-based uh, economic framework, right? To say, if we take this loan, how do we assess the human rights impacts? How do we assess the impacts on South Africa in, in the long run in general? In terms of non-conventional economic policies that um, the National Treasury could consider, we've, um, as the Institute for Economic Justice, have written a number of proposals. And one of them, which I'll express here, is a solidarity tax. To say that the solidarity fund, um, relying on people to volunteer to give you money is not enough and that we need to structurally institute it and to say that those who are top earners, there's huge income inequality in this country, those who are top earners can basically subsidize um, the of the cost shifting within this economy. There's something called the paradox of thrift, which means during a crisis, people actually save more than they spend. So actually, when you look at the upper income people, they're actually not spending that money, they're just saving it. And what that's doing is actually impacting the aggregate demand of our economy. And that hurts our economy, right? Because people are not spending. And if people are not spending, the economy cannot grow. So effectively, one way that we can redistribute that income is actually to tax those at the top and to extend, for instance, the grants, which are currently insufficient and not adequate at all to deal with the amount of need there is in this economy at this exact moment. So that's one of the ways that we've proposed in the, in the past. We've also proposed bonds, which the government, um, SARB, has actually been implementing. Um, and that's another other way that government can raise those resources. Of course, the GEPF, the Government Employment Pension Fund, is another avenue that we could consider for how to finance some of these, um, these efforts at, at this particular moment, but also efforts for the future. But I think a lot of people, most importantly, is a lot of people talk about financing and how can we afford 500 billion. But the reality is that government is not spending new 500 billion. That's not the amount of money the government is actually spending. The UIF is effectively money that already existed. It's not that Treasury is going to give the UIF um, 40 billion. It already exists, right? Um, and part of that money, out of that 500 billion, 130 billion of it is being reprioritized from an existing budget. So it's not new money. It's just money being taken from what existed to now finance something else, right? So we have to, to, to think about these nuances. Out of that total package, some people estimate anything between 60 and 100 billion is actually new money. So that's only the extent of the new money that we are seeing from this 500 billion package. So as much as people are um, sort of um, up in arms about 500 billion, it's really not 500 billion. Um, and maybe we will need 500 billion for the next phase of economic interventions we need. And then we'll really need to seriously consider um, how to finance it um, in the best way possible that does not hurt the people or the economy. In terms of the 500 billion that's been announced by the president, we need to consider that 130 billion of it is actually being reprioritized from an existing budget. Um, why we should be concerned about this is what is being cut off. 
Um, and impo most importantly is we cannot cut expenditure to social and ec economic infrastructure that we're going to need in the future. It doesn't help us to cut from budgets that are going to be detrimental for us in the future. And as we also know with the, the government over the last, since 2014-15, they've actually been cutting per capita expenditure on um, non-interest expenditure. This includes education, health, and all the other um, departments. So it's really concerning um, to think about how that money will be reprioritized in the context that there are already been um, declines in expenditure in um, important social and economic expenditure. So we should be worried about that. Uh, but also, I don't think that the 50 billion is sufficient in terms of the grants. So as we, as the president announced it, we thought that it would be a 500 rand increase, for instance, per child. Um, but that's not actually what's going to happen. The increase is per beneficiary, right? And this is an exclusionary mechanism because if you are a parent of those children or one child or whatever, um, you actually are excluded from the COVID relief grant, which is meant for the unemployed um, because you are listed as a beneficiary, but you are actually not a beneficiary, you're actually a caregiver. Um, so huge concerns around how this money has been allocated and the tools that are being used to exclude many. Um, for instance, the, the, the SASA has said that about 50% of people who have applied actually don't qualify. And I'm inclined to wonder how many of those don't qualify because they are already recipients of grants on behalf of children. Um, so that's that and also 300, 350 rand is simply not enough.